Well, I want to welcome everybody and thank you for coming to uh, another in our series on free speech and academic freedom. This, these uh, uh, programs are being hosted by Tri-College University, Humanities North Dakota, North Dakota State University Student Government, North Dakota State University College of Arts, Humanities, Social Sciences, and of course, the Northern Plains Ethics Institute of which I am director. Um, the mission of the Northern Plains Ethics Institute is to inspire democratic participation in social and ethical issues affecting the Northern Plains and beyond. And of course, academic freedom and free speech are huge in that. I want to introduce our speakers. Um, and uh, so I, I actually read these, and I know it's not as great, but Amna Khaled is the Associate Professor of History at Carleton College. Her work focuses on modern South Asian history and the history of medicine. Growing up under a series of military dictatorships, she has a strong interest in issues relating to censorship and free expression. Last year, she served as the inaugural John Stuart Mill Faculty Fellow at Heterodox Academy. This academic year, she is junior fellow with the study of liberalism and a free society at the Institute of Humane Studies. Khaled hosts a podcast called Banished. And by the way, I recommend people look at that because it's pretty good, which explores what happens when people, ideas and works of art come into conflict with modern sensibilities. Jeff Snyder is Associate Professor of Educational Studies at Carleton College. He studies historical questions about race, national identity, and the purpose of public education in the United States. He wrote the 2018 book, Making Black History, The Color Line, Culture and Race in the Age of Jim Crow. Snyder has an interest in issues of academic freedom and free expression, especially as they relate to liberal arts education. Together, they have written numerous art pieces about academic freedom and free expression and how these issues intersect with social justice concerns and campus diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives. Their co-written works have appeared in the Chronicle of Higher Education, Inside Higher Ed, and the New Republic, among other publications. Now, they will present for approximately 20 to 30 minutes, and then we will begin conversations. If you have a question, please write it in the chat, and what I will do is ask you to unmute if we select a question so that you can talk to them directly. Well, thank you, and I, I don't think we do applause, but uh, I'm turning it over to the two of you. Thank you so much, Dennis, for that, for that very kind introduction. Uh, thank you to the Northern Plains Ethics Institute, uh, to the NDSU uh, Arts and Sciences people, to NDSU student government uh, for sponsoring this event. Uh, thanks to all of you who I see in your little squares. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, do you want to share our sure. presentation? Uh, so uh, like Dennis said, we're going to talk for about 20 minutes, and we're especially eager to uh, engage with you all and, and, and take your questions. We'd like to start um, with thumbnail sketches of three different cases. So I want you to consider these cases and consider the following question for each case. Was there a violation of the faculty member's academic freedom? Okay, so three cases. Was there a violation of the faculty member's academic freedom? So in 2012, NDSU professor Molly Secker Turner, forgive me if I've pronounced that last name incorrectly, uh, was awarded a federal grant for a voluntary sex education program for teenagers. In 2017, she received more funding, brought in more funding to NDSU, uh, and partnered with Planned Parenthood to carry out a set of workshops. Last year, a number of different Christian groups and conservative organizations objected to the university's partnership with Planned Parenthood, followed by the North Dakota legislature actually passing legislation that banned public universities from receiving state funding if they partnered with abortion rights organizations. Professor Secker Turner's research program was effectively thwarted, and she announced last June that she was leaving NDSU for Montana State University. That's case number one. Case number two, in December of 2020, a University of Illinois Chicago law professor, Jason Kilborn, posed a hypothetical question on a law exam, one he had used many times in previous years. The question included the following section, verbatim as it appears on the slide. I'll just give you all a minute to, to look at the slide.
So after some students uh, complained to the dean of the law school that they were upset and offended by the redacted slurs on this exam, uh, the University of Illinois Chicago suspended Jason Kilborn and launched an investigation. He was only able to return to the classroom after completing an extensive course of mandatory sensitivity training. Uh, FYI, in a coda to the, uh, to the case, um, uh, one of the sensitivity readings that was assigned to Kilborn included the N-word redacted exactly as it had been on the exam that he had, uh, that he had offered. Um, okay, last case here. Uh, in October 2020, a professor at Collin College, which is a community college in Texas, was watching the vice presidential debate and tweeted out the following commentary. Uh, the moderator needs to talk over Mike Pence until he shuts his little demon mouth up. Collin College sanctioned L.D. Burnett for allegedly breaching their core values of dignity and respect, calling her post hateful, vile, and ill-considered. Uh, she was summarily fired, I think it was in, within two weeks of, of sending this particular tweet. So in our view, the academic freedom of all three of these faculty members was indeed violated, was indeed uh, infringed upon. And we want to explain why. And we'll explain why by working our way through a kind of definition of, of academic freedom and then a discussion of its significance. But what I want to flag for you all and keep in mind uh, as we move forward is that these three examples focus on uh, three different aspects of academic freedom that are absolutely essential to understanding it as a concept. Uh, the first you will have seen focuses on research, the second on teaching, and the third on what is called extramural speech. So the American Association of University Professors, the AAUP, uh, founded in 1915 uh, by, among others, the philosopher John Dewey, uh, has produced two landmark landmark works that pertain to academic freedom in the United States. Uh, the first is the 1915 Declaration on Academic Freedom and Academic Tenure. It articulates the following principle as absolutely fundamental to academic freedom. Professors should be able to carry out their work, namely research and teaching, free of political interference. And this document spelled out that interference, political interference, could take different forms, including the vested interest of trustees, the political considerations of legislatures in the, in the case of, and legislators in the case of public institutions, and the, quote, unconsidered impulses of popular feeling. Any view, the AUUP said, that departed from conventional standards was likely to be regarded with suspicion by one or more of these constituencies. The university, the statement asserted, should be an inviolable refuge from the tyranny of the ruler and the tyranny of public opinion. Refuge from the tyranny of the ruler and the tyranny of public opinion. So this landmark 1915 statement was followed up uh, some years later in 1940. And here's where you really see kind of the, the basic foundation for what we now understand as, as academic freedom in the academy in the United States. There are three key pillars of academic freedom that are spelled out here. Inquiry and research, teaching, freedom of extramural utterance and action. Now, some people say that academics use too much jargon. But, I mean, extramural speech and action just flows off the tongue. Um, uh, at any rate, so what it really means here, right, is what you say and do in your capacity as an individual citizen. With respect to numbers one and numbers two, the central rationale for academic freedom has always been that free expression facilitates the discovery of truth or knowledge, and that the production and dissemination of knowledge is beneficial to individuals and society. The AUP put it like this. The common good depends upon the free search for truth and its free exposition. Now, as Dennis knows, you can't get through an academic freedom or free speech talk without mentioning John Stuart Mill. It's a contractual obligation. Uh, Mill's a key figure here. 
He argued that giving people the widest possible latitude to express their views and advance their claims maximizes our chances of discovering what's true. In his Tour de Force 1859 publication on liberty, he makes a three-part argument for the centrality of free speech to truth-seeking and knowledge building. You can think of a shorthand as, as Mill's trident. So in any given question, debate, argument, or investigation, there are three possibilities. Uh, the first is that your view is wrong and you need free speech uh, for people to be able to correct you. The second is that you're partially correct and you need free speech and contrary viewpoints to help you get a more precise understanding, often by synthesizing and powerfully combining a range of different perspectives. And third, in the unlikely event that you're 100% correct, you still need people to argue with you, according to Mill, uh, which, because if, if you never have to defend your point of view, uh, there's a very good chance that you don't really have a sophisticated understanding of it. Uh, Mill's distinction between inheriting and adopting an idea is, is vital here, and I think relates to, to academic freedom centrally. When you inherit an idea, according to Mill, uh, you subscribe to it simply it's because what your family believes, what your peers believe, or it's conventional wisdom. When you adopt an idea, you subscribe to it because you've carefully considered it, subjecting it to critical scrutiny and analysis of precisely the type that we hope to see at colleges and universities. Now, if we're thinking about the pantheon of academic freedom and free speech in the pursuit of truth, uh, you gotta have Mill, you also just gotta have Galileo, a kind of pat patron saint for the academic freedom cause, a professor who challenged the church's geocentric model a man so committed to the pursuit of knowledge no matter where it led that he spent the last years of his life under house arrest. Third leg of the stool I described before, right? Uh, research, teaching, extramural speech and action. College and university teachers are not just educational professionals, right? We are also citizens. And when we speak, this is the AUP, when professors speak or write as citizens, they should be free from institutional censorship or discipline. In other words, I shouldn't fear for my job as a prof if I tweet out, Roe v. Wade should be overturned, or if I spend a Saturday afternoon joining a Black Lives Matter protest. At most institutions, academic freedom is guaranteed, or at least promised, to faculty members when we sign a contract, right? Contracts in turn often refer to the faculty handbook where an institution's commitment to academic freedom is delineated. So this is an important point, right? There are philosophical and conceptual uh, reasons to defend academic freedom. And then there's also this contractual legal element, uh, the ways in which academic freedom is actually encoded into uh, faculty uh, handbooks and faculty contracts. You'll often hear academic freedom and free speech invoked simultaneously, but they're actually pretty different. Um, free speech is the right to express one's ideas, however true or false they may be, okay? When it comes to academic freedom and teaching and research in particular, facts, accuracy, and evidence all matter. I don't know what's a big public square in, in Fargo, but if I, if I go to the big public square in Fargo and take out a, a sign that says the world is flat and parade around all day, um, singing the praises of the flat earth theory of the world, uh, I'm not gonna be arrested, right? That speech is protected by the First Amendment. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's true. But if a geology professor at NDSU comes over to me and says, hey, you know what, I really like that sign. Let me take that sign into my classroom and spends the next uh, you know, remainder of the term advancing the flat earth thesis, that's a problem, right? That's a form of educational malpractice that is not covered by academic freedom. Why? Because it violates the norms and standards of a discipline, in this case, geology, right? So competence and expertise matter with respect to academic freedom in a way that they don't with free speech. Academic freedom stipulates that what counts as good work in geology is decided by geologists, right? This is a critical, um, critical point of view from an academic freedom perspective, hence the importance of things like credentialing, doctoral programs, and, and peer review. All right, so I'm going to pass the mic now to Amna, 
is going to walk us through some of the key threats to academic freedom today uh, and give us a sense of, of where they're coming from and what they're all about. Thanks, Jeff. So arguably, the most significant threats to academic freedom today are coming from what have commonly come to be known as anti-CRT or anti-critical race theory bills. While most most of these bills regulate what can be taught at the K through 12 level. There were at least three last year in, in, in three states, Idaho, Iowa, and Oklahoma, where bills were passed specifically tailored to constrain discussions in higher education settings. Primarily, this was about content related to race, racism in the US, um, and US history. Pan America has quite aptly termed these bills educational gag orders. Now, as of, 19, uh, as of January this year, we have 38 such bills that are pending, and those target higher education in 20 states. In light of a new law, Iowa State University expressly instructed professors to refrain from assigning mandatory readings on critical race theory and not to draw scrutiny of their classrooms by evaluating the language used to describe their programs and events. Oklahoma City Community College ended up canceling a course on race and ethnicity. Now, allow me to give you a few examples of the kinds of restrictions that fam faculty will be subjected to if these bills come to pass. In Mississippi, the proposed legislation prohibits professors from assigning materials that include the idea that the state of Mississippi is fundamentally, institutionally, or systemically racist or that racial equity should be given preference in education and advocacy over racial equality, a violation that would result in the college losing access to all state funding. In South Carolina, the proposed bill forbids professors teaching in a way that repeatedly distorts or misrepresents verifiable historical facts or omits relevant and important context. The bill calls for a public reporting hotline for alleged violations. Universities out of, out of compliance risk losing state funding and their tax-exempt status. Bills in Missouri, Pennsylvania, Oklahoma, South Carolina, and Wisconsin would bar college classrooms from discussing the idea that a person should receive favorable treatment by virtue of their race or sex. So this means that as a professor, you will no longer be able to discuss affirmative action, even if you're only discussing it to disagree with it. Bills under consideration in many states specifically aim to ban topics from the curriculum. In Alaska and Oklahoma, proposed legislation would ban me from teaching or from assigning an assignment that my students are, students are currently undertaking in the History Methods course, which is a review of the 1619 Project. The New York bill would ban the 1619 Project or any similarly developed curriculum. And Missouri takes the cake. The bill there would ban seven different curricula, including the 1619 Project, the Southern Poverty Law Center's Learning for Justice curriculum, and the Zinn Education Project. Now, I want to pause here and say that the implications are far-reaching. Think about it. Students training to be teachers would not be able to discuss these curricula in college classroom settings. Now to turn to threats to academic freedom that are coming from a different place. Um, Jeff and I like to call, the, call this particular group of threats um, or this ideology Anti-Racism Inc. and the reigning DEI discourse. Let me begin with a few definitions. We believe that most students, faculty, staff and administrators at colleges and universities across the country are anti-racist. The vast majority of people involved in higher education reject the idea that some races are born superior and others inferior. We want to live in a world free of racial prejudice and discrimination, a world where your racial background does not prevent people from achieving their full human potential. So this is by way of clarifying what we believe. Jeff and I see the history of anti-racism in the US as righteous, brilliant, and necessary from the 19th century abolitionist movement to the classic civil rights era of MLK, Jr. and Malcolm X. <clears throat> The struggle for civil rights in the US has involved remarkable creativity, organization, courage, and daring. So what we want to do here is draw a sharp distinction between anti-racism and what we call anti-racism Inc. The central figure or the patron saint, as Jeff likes to say, 
um, who is responsible for articulating and pro promoting anti-racism Inc. is Dr. Ibrahim X. Kendi. Kendi is the closest approximation we have to a national re leader on race relations, director of the Boston University Center for Anti-Racist Research and author of the runaway bestseller, How to Be an Anti-Racist. His anti-racism framework has been enthusiastically embraced by corporations, nonprofits, schools, and sadly also by colleges and universities. His ideas are often central to anti-racist programming and other DEI or diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives um, being undertaken at colleges and universities. In Kendi's view, there is a great divide in America between the souls of injustice <clears throat> and justice. He argues that the full arc of American history can be understood as a battle between these two schools with genocide, enslavement, Trump, and bigotry on one side and equality science, Biden, and empathy on the other. Kennedy famously wrote that every policy in every institution, in every community, in every nation is producing or sustaining either racial inequity or equity between racial groups. Now, this dichotomous view in which people, ideas, public policies can neatly be divided into racist and anti-racist is the foundation of Anti-Racism Inc. and by extension also the basis of the dominant framework for DEI on college campuses. <clears throat> the Anti-Racism Inc. juggernaut has helped to make a commitment to diversity synonymous with rooting out racism. White folks in this model must be allies or better yet, we learned this at our anti-racism training, which was mandatory, better yet accomplices and co-conspirators in the struggle for racial justice. In the anti-racism training session that I just mentioned at our college, one of the trainers said that any professor who was not on board with a mission to dismantle white supremacy at their institution could not possibly be making a contribution to DEI. Any incentives, no matter how well-intentioned, that give special consideration to research in areas and topics that align with what is considered DEI pose a threat to free and open inquiry. So at the university, in the University of California system, for instance, candidates receive a boost in their research uh, if their research contributes to understanding barriers faced by women and racial or ethnic minorities. Now, this is an extremely narrow and alarmingly instrumental vision of what constitutes DEI scholarship. <clears throat> Viewpoint diversity is all but non-existent when it comes to DEI initiatives. And if you run afoul of the tenets of Anti-Racism Inc., you may very well find yourself and your academic freedom severely cur curtailed. Take the case of the University of, uh, University of Chicago professor, geophysicist Dorian Abbott. Abbott was slated to deliver the prestigious John Carlson Lecture at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He was planning to speak about the potential of life on other planets. I consider that a rather important issue for us to be thinking about in this day and age. MIT's Earth, Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences Department canceled the lecture after social media outrage erupted surrounding Abbott's public criticism of campus diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives. Now, the sticking point here was a Newsweek op-ed that he wrote in which he sharply criticized campus diversity initiatives, calling for colleges to make admissions and hiring decisions strictly based on individual merit and qualifications. It's worth underscoring over here that his talk was canceled not for the content of what he was going to share, but rather his political views on a matter that was completely unrelated to his conversation or his discussion that day. So you can see Anti-Racism Inc. Um, in play in the increasingly common practice. Um, you can also see it in play in the increasingly common practice of requiring mandatory diversity statements from candidates for hiring and promotion. Diversity statements pose a particular challenge for professors or faculty on the right, and even somewhat for those um, in the center. They put an added burden on anybody who might not subscribe to social justice positions um, this is Chris Benneke, a history professor at Bentley University. Abigail Thomas, a professor of mathematics at the University of California at Davis, has even put um, a sharper assessment on it, arguing that diversity statements are tantamount to a 
to a political litmus test that serve as a filter for those with non-conforming views. In the University of California system, required diversity statements for hiring and promotion are scored according to a rubric which you can download as an Excel spreadsheet at your convenience. UC Berkeley has adopted an even more elaborate three-tiered five-point scoring system. In recent searches conducted in the life sciences, this rubric was used to sort through 893 eligible candidates. Candidates were first evaluated on knowledge about DEI and belonging, then on their track record in advancing DEI, and finally on their plans for advocating and advancing DEI in their new positions. 600 and 79 of the candidates failed to progress through this trial by DEI metrics and did not even have their scholarly credentials evaluated. So in conclusion, the threats to academic freedom, the freedom to teach, research, and speak on matters of public concern in one's capacity as an individual, these threats are proliferating and coming from across the political spectrum. The Foundation for Individual Rights in Education has documented 426 incidents of scholars targeted for ideological reasons since 2015. Ideological straitjacketing of inquiry by definition will constrain viewpoint diversity and circumscribe the purview of faculty speech. It bears mentioning that when it comes to extramural speech, many of the cases where faculty have been punished, they've been punished for speech um, on what is considered offensive political views. I'd like to in end by invoking American jurist William Orville Douglas. His words underscore the true cost to society when academic freedom is compromised. Here is what he had to say. Where suspicion fills the air and holds scholars in line for fear of their jobs, there can be no exercise of the free intellect. Supineness and dogmatism take the place of inquiry. A problem can no longer be pursued to its edges. Discussion often leaves off where it should begin. Thank you, and we're interested to see what questions you have for us. Thank you for another talk that uh, um, I think gets at the boundaries of the subject and, and raises a, a number of issues. I'm going to start first with um, Tim Flackle's question. Tim, if you're able to unmute and ask your question. Right now, there's been discussion within our community uh, about a potential fine for school board members who speak out against a board position. So as an example of board votes, uh, you know, seven to two or, you know, seven to two or five to four to do something. Well, some of the board members disagree with that. And the board is looking to find them if they speak what their opinion on that issue is after the fact. Uh, so how is this impacted by free speech? That's the first part of my kind of question here. Uh, uh, your, your thoughts on that, they report to the people and how it might that be different than a member or members of an appointed board of higher education who speak out with an opinion that is different than what the full board vote on on an issue of policy. Because, you know, kind of, again, being the difference, one is elected, and one is appointed. Is there a difference? Folks that are joining us, is, did you understand my question? Or did you get enough of it so you can kind of respond? I, I got part of it. I got that you asked about school board members who might be speaking against a decision of the school board. Correct. And what I didn't get was the second half where you were So th those are elected school board members. Those are okay. elected, yes. So on the other case, what if you were a you know, member of the, like, the Board of Higher Education? Because I'm looking at both ed you know, education entities that govern and set policy over education, whether it's the K-12 level or the higher education level. Uh, but those members who are on a board, a state board, whether it's uh, you know in whatever state, uh, including North Dakota, uh, those are in essence often appointed in this case. So is there a difference between what they should or could do on a certain position? I mean, my initial thoughts on that would be if you are in an appointed position uh, that there may be certain rules and regulations that are in play with respect to 
wh whoever your your principal is, if you are you know appointed by the governor or something, and you mm -hmm. are you're speaking on a a policy that's um, been formulated by the governor where you're kind of a type of, of spokesperson for that policy. I, I do think that kind of professional norms would, you would try and represent the official perspective to the best of your ability. I think if you, if you had personal differences uh, with that on a particular policy, I think you need to make it very clear uh, that um, if you were going to take a stance that you weren't speaking in your official capacity uh, as, as appointed by the governor. And so you can actually see this in a lot of uh, academics, social media profiles. They will say things like, you know, views do not represent those of, of our employer. Um, but I do know um, from following local government uh, in Minnesota and elsewhere, there are often controversies where somebody who is a political appointee um, uh, will, <laughs> will make comments that are controversial uh, from the point of view of, of, of whoever appointed them. And those are definitely difficult to, to, to adjudicate. I would say, though, that the question is a really interesting one, and it's one that pertains, I think, more to questions of or, you know, the issue of free speech than to academic freedom. I think for um, people on school boards, I, my understanding is that they are not protected by academic freedom regulations. Um, but, but I'm looking at it that free speech is the overall yeah, umbrella the overall. under which yeah. uh, academic freedom exists we'll call it but could you could you describe the the the, the fine element you started your, your uh there was discussion that. as i understand and i'm just repeating what i've heard mm -hmm. uh that if say what can i you know say say there's a vote hypothetically this is a hypothetical that a school board votes that they should go from a five-day school week to a four-day school week it passes uh seven to two the two dissenters mm -hmm. have an opinion. So logically, if you're a reporter, you're going to report, you know, on one side of those that favor, but you want to get the other side too. The, you know, clearly there will be some discussion usually, but sometimes you want to hear both sides of the argument for the general public who elected the school board members. And there was discussion about should the two dissenters be fined if they speak contrary to the change that's been approved by the board so here is what i'd say um i don't know what the legal situation on this is i'm not equipped to comment on that but i would say that in principle that is a violation and a muzzling of people's uh right to speak their mind i mean i think that there has to be room for dissent in a healthy democracy and we have to be able to talk about why there are different points of view um so i would argue that um, elected or not, they should be able to comment, and there shouldn't they should not be fined for expressing what I assume is a considered decision that they've come to or a point of view that they've come to that doesn't agree with the overall whatever the the decision is. Now, when it comes to appointed, again, I'd go back to what Jeff was saying. I think it's important to signal that you're acting in your capacity as an individual mm -hmm. um, and I assume how much of you can say or speak freely may be governed by a contract that you sign when you're appointed but again in principle I would like to think that one should be able to speak in one's individual capacity making clear that they're not speaking for the government or the board or whoever they're working for. And just so you quickly know in terms of like the Board of Higher Education in North Dakota I've worked in both states, but sure. uh, there's a, you know people apply for it. Anybody can apply as long as they meet the qualifications. There's a list of five people that narrow it down. Forward three names to the governor. The governor picks one individual to fill the one spot, but then they are required to advise and consent by the Senate. So it's kind of a complicated process. Uh, so they're you know they're technically they're appointed, but they're it's a, a number of steps involved to get to that point. Uh, and I mean, clearly, people have different opinions. Yeah, I would just say one brief last comment. If, if 
the people's business is being conducted, um, you know, from a transparency point of view, it seems to me that there's a compelling public interest for people to hear from the dissenting voices, um, just as a matter of democratic governance. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think anytime you're talking about fines for <laughs> people who are either appointed or elected government representatives, I, I think that's a, a dangerous path to trod. Yeah, that seems like a bridge too far to me. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think we, it's, we should take an opportunity to adjust what happened here. Um, we're seeing extremism. Ex and I mean, really extremism in regards to this with the fining, for example, we're using legitimate or um, legislative and legal methods to reduce academic freedom. You saw the attempt of various folks who were doing everything they could to stop us from talking about it and to offend in such a way that they shut down all conversations entirely. You've been working in this area. Can you tell us what's going on or at least shed some insight into what I think is, at least initially, as psychopathic or sociopathic behavior? I think there is a really, there is a kind of paltry understanding of what free speech is about, um, in, in more broadly speaking. I don't think everyone understands what it is. And the trouble is, because of the way in which it is presented, it is very easy to weaponize. Um, and the and that's where I think the rub is when it's when something becomes so easy to weaponize, even if it's free speech, it can actually be used to shut down free speech, uh, or in this case, shut down academic freedom. So the one of the things that I think has happened over the last, I don't know, five years or something is that free speech itself has been weaponized. And many people who were champions of free, free speech have almost kind of wash their hands of being champions of it because they're so worried about the association with the likes of the people who were trying to shut down our conversation. Um, my response to that is, I think, I, you know, I, I really believe in what you did, which is, no, we do not cede the ground. We do not shut down the conversation. We do what we are here to do, which is continue to have discourse. So um, I think it is a matter where there's a very thin understanding of what free speech is. I don't, I feel like I'm repeating myself. Jeff, if you have something to contribute. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a concept, right, in terms of the First Amendment called the, the heckler's veto, right? So the idea that Jeff and Amna are invited to speak and somebody's gonna stand up and, and, and heckle us or interrupt the event to such a severe extent that it has to be canceled. And I, I don't think there are any serious proponents of academic freedom or free speech who understand free speech in that regard. I think that uh, people like Amna and I, myself would make you know, strict distinctions between uh, free expression and harassment, right? Uh, what we saw was an attempt to, to intimidate and, and harass a group of people who are coming together to have a conversation on an important topic. So I, I do think that um, with these terms, there are people who take the free element, whether it's academic freedom or free speech, and push it to its absolute limit for cynical ends to a point where it has no value. So I would just say that um, you know, for some people who think that, oh, well, they're free speech proponents, they think that anything, anything goes. That's not, that's not true, right? We need to encourage a a culture of free speech, which has um, uh, equal respect and places just as much emphasis on the freedom and capacity to listen and to learn as it does on the, 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 the freedom and capacity to raise our own voices. Well, and I think you're getting to uh, an important point. When we're talking about free speech, and academic freedom, the assumption is always we're trying to increase human knowledge. We're trying to learn new things, to think about things in new ways. It's positive, it builds. Even if it goes down a dead alley, we've learned something, this alley doesn't work or maybe it needs an um, explosion at the end of it to make it go to the next thing. 
but because there's a lot of stuff that we do in academia that people say, well, that's not terribly interesting. But the intention is to make human knowledge, expand human knowledge in positive ways. Free speech isn't about shutting other people down and forcing viewpoints on individuals. Academic freedom is damaged when that is the focus is to stop human knowledge from expanding, or at least the investigation of what makes us human. But anyways, I'm ranting, and Ann Denton has a really good comment, so I want to turn it over to her. Tyler, can you unmute? Ann, thanks. Hi. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. And I also really appreciate that you uh, kept it going because, I mean, I think, uh, as you said, it's uh, <clears throat> if, if we let the people who want to disrupt um, this kind of event, uh, we let them win, that's, that's a, a, a bad thing. Um, so so um, I, I thought the presentation was, was excellent. I liked every one of those three examples. Uh, I thought they were very well chosen, uh, not just in terms of the three uh, means of um, in, in which academic freedom should be uh, allowed, but also because they show different uh, different political uh, spectra where where there could be issues. Um, the one uh, thing over which I stumbled was right towards the end uh, after the examples uh, was the hiring. And I mean, what I um, uh, with that, uh, I think if you just really let people who are currently in a position, in a sort of a, a position where we, we teach from a, a, a elevated podium, it's not always elevated, usually it's not, but I mean, anyway, figuratively, we're the ones who have the microphone. <laughs> um, if the people who have the microphone... That's us, actually. We're the ones <laughs> with the microphone. So uh, if the people who have the microphone um, get to be uh, the ones who pick their uh, successors, uh, there is always going to be some level of tenancy of uh, he uh, hiring people who are like us. And I mean, uh, what's the, what is an objective criterion for uh, accomplishment when uh, papers are also reviewed by the people who have the microphone? And uh, the publications that, that get published are the ones that suit those who are already in the position. Uh, I mean, you, you can find all sorts of uh, positive feedback loops. Uh, so how are you going to get out, the, out of those positive feedback loops? And I mean, John Stuart Mill knew that. <laughs> yes. So I, I think, thank you for the excellent question. I, I do think, I don't have the stats handy, but so I'm going to make this up, but it gives you a sense of, 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 of the point, which is, you know, 80% of the political science positions that are hired in any given year come from the same eight institutions, right? This is this idea of kind of the re reproduction of um, particular discourses, particular schools of thought, right? Kind of re reinforcing the, 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 the status quo and continuing to elevate the, the voices of, of the people who have the, the mics. Um, so, so at least one thing Amna and I have, have thought about, this is in our own original idea, but people have suggested, look, if, if, if we want to um, try and combat this re very real problem of kind of elite reproduction, right, um, which you can actually see in the Supreme Court uh, with the, the rich diversity of Ivy League schools that people have gone to for law school, chiefly being Harvard and Yale, right? There are two of them. Um, uh, you, you, can, you can say, Okay, hey, let's let's zoom out our search. If you're talking about hiring, let's go beyond the six big name schools or big name programs. And I think that takes an intentional effort. To me, that's that to me is is a, is a less ideological approach to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, uh, so yes, I I I don't think Amna and I are saying um, don't do anything. There's nothing to see here. Uh, we've both written extensively uh, about, you know, how absolutely shameful it is that college universities are not more representative, especially of the ethno-racial background of, 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 of the United States, right? Far too many, uh, black, uh, far too few black and Hispanic and indigenous scholars on campuses, not to mention students. Yeah, I was just going to say, and um, you know, we have written about this, but I think there are better ways to do this. I, I agree with you. I think there are problems, but the ways to get beyond those problems in hiring and promotion are, say, for instance, to move away from the publication bias. You know, what are the journals people are publishing and how do we score them are some of the things that actually are, are the mechanisms that are 
intrinsic to reproducing this kind of elite uh, reproduction of people in academia and also not just elite but you know of a political kind of a particular political um, orientation so i'd say that there are better ways to do this and they're more effective that are not as i think the current dei statements require you know it's it's a it's kind of back-ended it's dealing with the problem we have by introducing an ideological commitment which is only going to produce a different kind of problem it's not going to actually address the problem so it's not by any means to say that problems are not there it's just that i think that there are better ways to get at it and we're just jumping onto the bandwagon of dei um, which will you know it's only a matter of time will produce more problems than it solves okay my second question would be how far down does academic freedom extend we clearly know it you know, goes to the professors. I would assume it should go to their graduate assistants if they're guest lecturing or teaching or, or whatever else. But how about students who are doing group work and then they're reporting their findings? Does the same apply to students in a classroom that applies to faculty in terms of academic freedom? It's a really good question, Tim. And um, I've been thinking about this a lot and I, I would say, you know, I started out by thinking this does apply to our students, only to realize actually that the AUP does not extend that academic freedom to students. Students do not technically have that academic freedom, but I think what students do have, and there are organizations like FIRE that have defended their rights, um, is the right to free speech, according to the First Amendment, at least on public campuses and also private campuses where they make a commitment to um, abide by it. And I think this is exactly why students' rights to free expression have to be protected on college campuses, because technically they're not protected by the umbrella of academic freedom. yet. They are serving the same ends, I would argue, that academic freedom serves, which is in the search for or in the production of knowledge, we have to be able to share our ideas freely in good faith. Now, faith is something you can't adjudicate on, um, but and the trouble is adjudicating on it goes down, uh, the consequences are worse. So I would err on the side of attributing good faith and, and arguing for students' rights for, to free expression um, with, within the same parameters that we talked about for professors, like if you're in a geology class, you're doing it on materials that are relevant and engaging uh, in relevant questions, not something that you want to just mouth off about. Yeah, to, to me, this would be less a matter of, you know, a contractual guarantee of, of, of mm -hmm. academic freedom as you have with profs and more college university campuses inculcating um, an atmosphere of free and open inquiry. I, I think the context matters. I think in a in a classroom discussion, um, faculty are going to be experts. We're going to know more in general about them about the material. But it seems to me in the classes that I teach, I want my students to have uh, the latitude to express a range of different views. Of course, I'm going to ask them, "What's your evidence? Where do you see that in the text?" Um, but I think that the learning will be diminished. Um, uh, for example, just talk about a place like Carleton, right, with a strong liberal liberal bias. Uh, I often find myself playing devil's advocate uh, when I teach, say, about educational policy to raise different ideas that might be, you know, right, center, right, libertarian policy ideas that the students don't necessarily feel comfortable bringing up. I, I do think there's an interesting dynamic here, right, because uh, the students' academic work I will treat Amna as a you know a historian and colleague. She's a she's a peer, right? If we're evaluating each other's work, but with my students, I don't think of them as my peers. I get out my red pen and I tell them, "Hey, you got this wrong," or "You need to think more about that." So I, I think different norms and standards apply in different contexts. But I would I would say that you know academic freedom in, in terms of trying to be able to test out ideas and experiment uh, should to my mind, should be at the heart of every classroom, um, uh, of every class um, at a college or university. Shannon Euchre has a question for you. Shannon, are you still here? And sorry if I mispronounced your last name. No problem. Yeah, I'm here. So I, um, I'm i part of NDSU Ag Affairs DEI Council. And just hearing you, Amina, just now just mention that you think there are 
I can see it as being a dangerous pathway as well. So if you have anything that you could point me to in the way of an article or a book that you've read to help with our DEI actions here on campus, I would love to share that information with my council. Thank you. Can I ask a question of, of, of Shannon? I, I was just curious if you could expand on kind of what, what are the issues that your office is considering now or what are the key questions that you're that you're thinking through so in our first 18 months we've uh, read some some texts and articles um, and we're, we're working on building a what we hope to call it DEI exploration hub where faculty and staff on campus can take work time but on their own to explore questions that they have about where they fit into the context of DEI so it wouldn't be anything that was mandatory it wouldn't be anything that even has to be publicly shared because we know that this is a really uh, this can be a, a really sensitive issue mm -hmm. and we want people to have time for themselves with themselves because I, I even you know i i wanted to be part of this group from the beginning and i find that it's it's really difficult work sometimes i'm sure that we all know that so um i just want to make sure we keep going in the right direction or that we are moving in the right direction and any help to that end is great yeah, I really appreciate the, the question and the comments because I do think that as skeptical as Amon and I are about certain aspects of, 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 of DEI uh, kind of rhetoric, uh, I'll, I'll just speak for myself personally, I, I, I am uh, d delighted that there's so much energy surrounding these issues right uh, thinking about diversity thinking about underrepresented populations on campus these these issues to me are close close to my heart i personally think they're they're vitally important and so how do we harness i guess for me it would be how do, how do we harness that energy in the most constructive productive and powerful ways and i i i i, I appreciate that you know college universities are getting resources to, to, to ramp up some of these public facing um, you know, networks that you were describing or, 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 or website. And I do think they have uh, enormous, enormous potential, especially if they're not just copy and, and pasted. One thing I've noticed, if you go to a lot of DEI offices, um, websites across the country, there's, there's a certain degree of of similarity and one expects to see some similarity of course because the issues might be well hey how do we attract um, uh, more BIPOC faculty right so that's going to be a key concern but then you often see a kind of the, the the same little not little the same solution offered you don't see a lot of diversity of approaches in the DEI um, uh, websites that I've seen at least um, so uh, keep us posted would be curious to see what you what you come up with or what you and your team come up with okay I, I have a question for you because this came up at NDSU um, we had an issue of academic freedom in the classroom versus academic freedom in our research um, have you thought some about this and can you sort of tell us how to understand I, I, are they exactly the same are they different how do those work you know, there are guardrails to your academic freedom in the classroom. You can't just talk about anything. You can't present things like Jeff pointed out that are inaccurate or that are, you know, and if you are presenting them, you can't present them as the consensus within the field. You could say this is something that is held by some people. So you can, it can be there as part of the conversation, but it, the context is key. Um, so the freedom, again, it, you know, the, the freedom part isn't just uh, without any responsibility. Uh, it comes, it's fundamentally connected to academic responsibility. When it comes to research, I'm trying to figure out, like you said, the question has come up. Can, can you give me an example or what, what is the context? I'm oh, well, here we have um, very wide rules on academic scholars, freedom and scholarship. Um, but we, we limit, of course, academic freedom in the classroom. It has to be about what the class is supposed to be about. So I can't start talking about politics right. in my intro to philosophy class unless that's somehow relevant to the class. That'd be hard to do. Yeah. Certainly would be impossible in logic. Um, but how, how far can you go for the research one? So we've got the guardrails for the classroom. 
are there limitations on academic freedom in um, the research? And I'm thinking, I can't remember his name was, I think it's Cornell West. He got into trouble because instead of writing books and so on, he was looking at rap or he did a, a he recorded an album, something along yeah, those lines yeah. as I recall. Yeah. I, I think this isn't an answer, mm -hmm. Dennis, but it's a it's a reflection. And I think where this gets tricky is because, you know, geology, right, I'm gonna, if there are geologists in the room, please correct me, but I imagine that there's an overwhelming consensus on the question of whether the world is flat, right? Um, then there are fields, within fields, you have developments that, that push the boundaries, right? That take different disciplinary forms that use different kinds of evidence. I mean, I'm just thinking about something like cultural studies that said, hey, uh, we're not just gonna read novels, we're gonna look at um, hip hop lyrics as texts. Uh, there, were, there were a lot of people who rolled their eyes at that and said, well, this isn't real scholarship. So I think there are two instances here where the academic freedom question gets tricky in terms of figuring out, is this person competent? One is pushing the boundaries from within the field, right? Um, and you just see that play out again and again. There was a time when oral histories in, my, in our profession, 100 years ago, people said, that's not serious. You can't just go up and talk to people. It's not a text. Right. And, you know, oral history is a key component of that any serious historian uses now. But then there's also the advent of interdisciplinary work where you have new fields that are being developed and there, there aren't any real, you know, kind of like set standards in those fields. And so I think those questions are particularly hard to adjudicate. Is this scholarship sound? It's never been done before. How do we how do we know? So I actually don't think that anybody, even the strongest academic freedom proponent has a good answer for, for those cases because who's who's to judge when you're doing something completely innovative well the people to judge are your peers and um, I think you know both your peers within your own institution and your peers more broadly within your field and sometimes I feel like peers don't make a call that you might necessarily agree with um, but those are the standards which lay you know that that kind of guard the parameters of what is considered scholarship or not so I don't think that an institution or an administrator should be allowed to um, nix something and decide that it's not scholarship. That is where I would draw the line. But I do think that we have to, uh, there is a mechanism of peer evaluation and peer assessment that even though it may go against what you want, we have to respect. Um, and sometimes it takes pushing the boundary several times to have something incorporated into you know, the mainstream of a particular field. And that's the process. And, and I think that's one of the rubs because some of the sometimes it advances, that's the advancement and it's getting stifled. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking about uh, the tectonic um, plate theory, yeah. I believe was proposed by a person who wasn't in the field <laughs> and they made fun of him. They wouldn't listen to him. He was, and it turns out, He's mostly right from what my dim memory of it is. Yeah. And I'm thinking, um, since I work on some of the stuff about decolonization of language, um, that's pushing boundaries as well on just how we use language to describe the world. Um, we're very Eurocentric. And mm -hmm. so to, to attack it is, or to question it is to be considered, well, you're not doing the work that you can't. <laughs> this is a different culture of thinking um, that's trying to remove things from language. And, and I would see that as, you know, the kinds of, I see what you're saying, which is it's holding it back and this is an advancement, but that back and forth is exactly what we are in the business of. And yeah. sometimes, you know, it's, it takes a little while to push, but, but for some, it will not count as an advancement. And that's okay too. I, I would see that as, a sign, like we said elsewhere, you know, of, of the intellectual vibrancy of the field that not everybody agrees. Um, so maybe we need to shift a little bit our idea of, or our kind of attitude towards disagreement. Right. Well, and also, I think we have something that's better than what we used to have in the past with just print journals and with gatekeepers. Um, the internet can be a disaster, as we saw just a little while ago, or it could be an amazing thing where in which you can get ideas out, and so that when people are searching for something, they could actually that can actually pop up 
And then there can be new discussions, new thoughts on it. But I don't want to dominate this conversation. I know Tyler has a question. How does academic freedom differ between private and public institutions? And then I was just kind of curious how the First Amendment works with private universities. So students may get more of a personalized uh, um, education, yet there may be limitations in a private setting. So I was just curious about that. Thank you. It's an excellent question, Tyler, and thank you for it. Um, I think it would be fair to say that, you know, um, most public institutions and private institutions in terms of hiring when they hire their faculty do kind of agree on the AAUP guidelines for academic freedom. So even private universities, um, in some ways, it's kind of part of your your contract or ought to be part of your contract if it isn't we should be paying attention um now when it comes to F first amendment issues on campus i think you're quite right to point out that in some ways private institutions might be shortchanging students if they're not adhering to the first amendment and i think this is we've seen this happen in several instances where students at private institutions have been penalized for their speech which would have been protected on a public campus and the fact of the matter is that there's no uh, recourse uh, legal ro recourse for them because because a private institution doesn't necessarily abide by the First Amendment. Having said that, I think that the practice for many years has been that even private institutions would respect it. I think that is um, being put to the test right now a lot, precisely because of the kind of moment we're in and the kind of um, push for constraining speech that is coming from students themselves, sadly, uh, in many cases, and, and, and is then kind of taken on by administrators, I feel. So do you want to add to this? And uh, Yeah, just to build on what Amna was saying, I think for private institutions, the way that uh, free expression, free speech work is that it's a kind of honor system, right? Uh, we're going to incorporate this into our mission statement. Um, but if it's breached, uh, there's not really anything that a student can do. Whereas if you're a student at North Dakota State University, uh, you, you, you can sue <laughs> the, the university on First Amendment grounds if you feel like your, your free speech rights have been, um, have been abridged. I do think this question is interesting though in terms of private colleges that have a distinctive mission. Hmm. Um, so one of the disinvitation examples, we talked about Dorian Abbott being disinvited from MIT there was a college in Texas that's, uh, you know, explicitly a Southern Baptist institution. I'm blanking on the name right now, but they invited um, John, Meacham. John Meacham, the historian, to, to deliver a talk on civil discourse in the United States. And students complained about it, and he was ultimately disinvited. And their argument was that um, because Meacham had spoken before at Planned Parenthood events, uh, they didn't think that having him on campus aligned with the values of this particular institution, right? So there, I think people like myself, I don't think there's a legal basis to say, hey, you can't do that. You can't disinvite him, but you have to make a more principled case. You know, here's why I think this is this is troubling. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a terrific question and it's very, it's very murky at a lot of private institutions how much latitude there really is, especially for student free expression. And I think this is exactly where the tension is coming in with the new kind of DEI initiatives, which are very much predicated, um, at least the, the dominant ones are predicated on preventing offense, right? And not people's feelings not being hurt or certain groups feeling ostracized and feeling like they don't belong. And, and that is where the rub is, because if you start enshrining those kinds of initiatives in your college policy, then they will infringe upon students right to speak and it'll be a bigger problem likely on private campuses where they have no legal recourse than it will be on public campuses. I'm going to ask you to give us some final words. I see that we have used our conversation and I think used it wisely. So um, what would you like to leave with us? I have some thoughts, but did Go you want to? <laughs> okay. 
Um, so something that, that kind of struck me and left me wondering as I as we were working on on this particular talk was you know revisiting the AAUP um, principles three principles uh, which protect academic freedom and and I found the one around extramural speech is it, it actually is more murky than I would like it to be um, and that I think is something to think about I the exact wording do we have it it talks about how you know if you're talking in your speaking in your individual capacity as a citizen, not as a representative of the state. Yeah. So it says um, for extramural speech as scholars, uh, faculty should remember that the public may judge their profession and their institution by their utterances. Hence, they should at all times be accurate, should exercise appropriate restraint should show respect for the opinions of others and should make every effort to indicate they are not speaking for the institution. So, so here, like the last part I'm on board with, that they're not speaking for the institution, but what it means to show uh, a, a restraint and appropriate respect are subject to interpretation. And I think this is perhaps why we are seeing so many cases coming up where people's extramural speech is being framed as disrespectful, uncivil. Um, so, so, so I feel like there is language in there which, which leaves it open for people's extramural speech to be policed in ways that... Well, look at, sorry, look at the example of L.D. Burnett, who, who said that, you know, Mike Pence should shut his little demon mouth up. Um, that is rude, I think, personally. Uh, is, it, is it beyond the pale for Twitter? Definitely not, <laughs> right? Um, but but I, do, I do think, yes, it, 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 it's kind of this interesting case in which the AUP is saying, hey, you are citizens, you know, go forth and, 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 and claim your free speech rights. Keep in mind, you're a prophet. It could reflect badly on the profession. Um, what, what I would say, just um, I'm so grateful for all of you who, who stuck around and who are who are here, I, I see that there are some faculty, I understand that there are people in other positions in the college as well. I would be curious for, especially for the people um, who, who aren't faculty members to think about what role free expression and academic freedom, if any, play in their own professional work, right? This, this conversation is often dominated by people like Amna and I, who are, who are faculty members, and of course, the, that's hugely important, but, but I, I would say that these these issues are of great interest to everybody who's on a community uh, who's on a campus. All of the stakeholders, faculty, staff, administrators, students, um, and 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 so I think that there are there are uh, contributions that other stakeholders could make to enriching this discussion. Hey, here's what my view is from the dean of students' office. Um, and if people have thoughts along those lines, look Amna and I up on, online, and we'd be curious to to to, to hear from from you. Is is that a uh, um, offer to for us to put the emails on with this? Uh, if you want to chat, <laughs> yeah, I just want to make sure. By all means. By all means. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, by the way, I would also, and I I said I would let you finish, but uh, I'd also um, talk a little bit about humility. I think a lot of us have lost being humble and humility. That's required to be a good educator. It's required to be a good researcher because you always go in with the idea, I could be wrong and I can learn from others. And if we fostered that a lot more, I think folks would be a little more calm about uh, um, what counts and what's uncivil and so on, and a little more forgiving. But that being said, I'm going to draw this session to a close because they have uh, they're going to kindly do a session for the students only on academic freedom for students. But again, I want to thank um, our speakers for their excellent job in putting up with uh, some of the issues and actually showing how important free speech is. I also want to thank Tri College University, Humanities North Dakota, the North Dakota State University College of Arts. Humanities and Social Sciences, uh, NDSU Student Government, and uh, my folks at the NPEI uh, for sponsoring this and being such um, strong uh, proponents. And finally, NDSU ITS is so good. They're on the 
issue right now. They're with Zoom. Other than that, have a good day. And we hope we'll see you at the next event. I'll see y'all. Um, have a great Mrs. day. Kaylee? Yeah. Uh, we are a part of your philosophy class. Um, yep. Me and Kalechel. And yep. we just wanted to say thank you for sticking around. Um, we, we got like, we were even upset about how people took freedom of speech as the way of saying some things. Yeah. So we were just happy that it still stayed and like stuck around. So we want okay. to thank these speakers too. Thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Those, we appreciate that. those are my kids. <laughs> <laughs> I also just want to say that, you know, it struck us the first time and, and again this time. It's, it's yeah. delightful to know that the, um, that the student, uh, students are sponsoring this event and it goes to show that students care about these very important issues that well, are Well, I went to your guys' other uh, speak, um, when you guys spoke to about freedom of speech and just like seeing how that kind of went into play with this and how they kind of abused it in a certain way was kind of just like i was like this and how you explained about weaponizing it um i actually yeah. did a discussion post on it for our class because we have to do discussion posts and um i kind of put that into a perspective on the discussion post because of what you said mm. and um i was just like that kind of was weaponizing it because you're kind of abusing the power as of that point yeah absolutely but well, thank so you we for just kind of wanted to talk. say that. It's wonderful to have students. Of course, yeah. Thank you again for thank seeing you. around. Thank you. We'll see you all later.